I'm believing that's true because we're using um, frequencies that are somewhat used. Yeah. Like, you know, you can turn it on uh, a frequency that's close to another one and you'll kind of hear a break. Like bleed over? You'll hear it bleed over. Yeah. And so I have a hard time believing that spirit boxes are legit. Okay. <clears throat> but that's just me. Um, How do you feel about EVP? Uh, EVPs to me... I don't know. I, 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 do you I, feel like it's more credible than a spirit box? I absolutely. Okay. Um, I feel, and, and as a skeptic, it's kind of hard to say much of this is credible and I'd like to sure. see the science behind it. Uh, and EVPs are a little bit more credible because it's at a different frequency. You can't hear like a it's dog. It's at a consistent frequency. It's too. like at a dog whistle. You don't hear yeah. when, you know, you have to play it back and, you know, listen yeah. to it. That seems a little bit more legit to it's me than scanning. a spirit box. Okay. All right. Yeah. I don't know enough about the equipment. So I can tell you, like, I am someone who does believe in, in a lot of the paranormal stuff. Not all of it, because I think some of it is far-fetched mm-hmm. and some of it, obviously there's hoaxes and there's people that are trying to mess with other people. But just from my own experiences, I've had some pretty intense, unexplainable experiences. And that leads me to believe that there may be more out there than what we can see or what we actually understand. Mm-hmm. It may not be what we think it is. Like maybe calling it a ghost might be wrong. Maybe it's something different. But I think that there's a lot to this world and to this universe that we just don't understand and we don't know. Yeah. I mean, and so this is, you know, this goes out to all the investigators here in New Mexico. If you're out there and you had, and you're listening to me and going like, man, I want to prove this guy wrong. Prove me wrong. I want to know. Yeah. You know, if you have some proof that you've gained throughout your investigations and there are any other paranormal investigations, maybe that, you know, I, 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 I want to hear that proof. I want to see the proof. I want to hear prove my skeptic ass wrong. <laughs> just your ass. Just, just my skeptic ass. Prove it, prove, <laughs> prove it wrong. You know what I mean? Um, I want to believe. I really do. But yeah. I, as, as you know, I, throughout this time in my life, I've kind of found that uh, um, I, I, I think very logically and a lot sure. of scientific, scientific thinking yeah. when it comes to it. I try to disprove things before I can say yes, this is what it is. Um, and so I find myself being able to. Uh, I'm, I'm open to it. Yeah. Like, please prove it to me. So. So I, I get it. You're a skeptic. Yeah. What? So aside from the scientific wanting to understand part of your brain, what else is is interesting to you about paranormal activity and paranormal events? Well, you know, um, I guess it's just the idea of there being something else that isn't the norm sure something that you know it's maybe some hope that when we do die there is something after life or is it just us in the ground mm. you know uh, i'd like to know that um that there's something else yeah you know i think most of us would yeah that makes sense well these two places i think are probably haunted uh i think the press club is probably haunted for sure uh just because there's so many people that have experiences. Um, I don't know. Well, like I've said, you know, uh, these, if there was uh, a place that was going to be haunted, it, I think that, you know, the residual energy of people's lives there and this and that, uh, I think that does carry over perhaps. I yeah. mean, there's no proof of that obvious, but I'd, I'd like to think so. Well, and I don't know if you've ever seen this, but sometimes they can take a tree mm-hmm. and play it like a record. Have you seen that? No. Because it absorbs like the rings? Yeah, they like imprint some memories into into the tree. It's really fascinating. There's a whole thing about it. Um and so sometimes you can hear different things. And so and they've done this with other substrates as well like what are they hearing? Um I don't want to say things that are wrong, so I'm not going to I don't remember exactly, but I you can hear sounds i don't it's just weird sounds okay and there's some substrates too that like can be imprinted with sound yeah yeah and and record that i mean we've proven that with like magnetic tape and with absolutely with vinyl records and those types of things that there are substrates that can absorb that and Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it would be interesting to look into how much of this it that people are experiencing how much of this phenomena is related to that kind of it's a really good question. Physics. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I think there needs to be more studies in that kind of stuff. I'm not doing it. I'm tired. I'm not going to do lazy. it either. You know. Somebody else do it. But if you guys do it, let, <laughs> let us, us know. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> We're the worst. <laughs> We're useless, you guys. All right. Well, hopefully you enjoyed these two 
uh, historical cases. Uh, we'll have some follow up here with an interview, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then also we would just say like, aside from your ghost stories and things that you want to share with us, if you have any other places in New Mexico or mm, any ideas that you think we should go check out yeah, or we should do case a show recommendations. On. Yeah, yeah. Let us know. Email us at spugenios at gmail.com or go to dos com. That's D O S S P O O K Q U E N O S. Good job. Whew. That's a hard word to spell. It's not easy. We misspelled it like six times. At least. <laughs> I, I think I changed the face, Facebook page name like four times. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I could not get it together. So I'm sorry about that, but we like the name <laughs> still, so we're going to keep it. Hope you guys like it too. There we go. I'd like to start talking about the old hospital, which is now the boutique hotel known as Park Central. Um, so what I'd like to know is, first of all, if you want to give us some insight into the building itself, and then uh, what you guys have discovered in your investigation of this and, and any experience you have that may uh, validate some of what we've heard uh, from the general public. Absolutely. And and I'm going to kind of let Lydia field that as well, because she's got a kind of a unique connection um, or a pretty direct connection, I guess I should say, to the Park Central. And then I'll add um, anything I might want to after that, if that's okay with y'all. That's perfect. great. That's perfect. Yeah, so it's a awesome building. Um, I have actually been mesmerized by the building um, for, you know, since it was a hospital. Um, it's, you know, it was built in 1926. I actually worked there finally. Um, I moved on from um, where I was last working before that seven years, and I moved on to the Park Central. I worked there for a little over a year, um, and I loved it. Um, it's a gorgeous place. Um, it's got a lot of history. The only thing is, I mean, we didn't really get very many reports from guests of, you know, things happening in the hotel, but I'm sure, you know, if you were a guest yourself looking for it, you know, going yeah. in with equipment and whatnot, which I would like to one of these days just to see, you know, what actually happens just because it was a hospital. I mean, you know, um, that history by itself just says, you know. There's no telling what can be going on in that really, really old building. Um, but it's a gorgeous place, nonetheless. Yeah. Um, and there is a back building. Um, we called it the powerhouse. And um, there was there's like a really tall chimney back there. And people would always say, well, you know, it was a crematorium and whatnot. And I don't doubt that it was. Um, unfortunately, management wouldn't embrace the paranormal aspect of the building. So we couldn't really talk to, you know, management about any of that. But they did claim that it was an incinerator. So I suppose it could be used for both <laughs> at one point. But um, and then there's the doctor's residence also located mm -hmm. in the backside of the property. And that was the most historic part of the property itself. Um, it was left as original as they possibly could leave it to the original building. Oh, wow. So, yeah. What is it used for now? Um, just rooms. Um, honestly, the doctor's residence is uh, it has nine rooms in it. Uh, the powerhouse where the supposed crematorium is uh, just three rooms up there and they're all in the second story. Um, so, yeah. You know, it's really interesting because the hospital and the press club have uh, a really interconnected history. So it's definitely something that's fascinating to us as well, because. Um, for a couple of reasons, I will say that, you know, um, years ago, I would sit in the park, which is by the press club, and you could feel, I mean, you could literally feel the history and, and certain energies just kind of coming off of the, the old hospital before it had gone through all the renovations. And, you know, in the paranormal field, we know that when that kind of extensive renovation happens, sometimes it stirs the spirits up, but other times... Um, it will actually cause a lot of that energy to go away because things that they're attached to, they kind of serve as anchors, um, are sometimes destroyed or removed or taken out. Um, so I think that may be part of the reason, um, as well as the fact that, you know, they're not really embracing it. And I agree with you. I think embracing that as, as a, a revenue stream is really a wise idea because, you know, there's a lot of people out there interested in, in finding out about that history because the hospital has been both, uh, it's been both a tuberculosis hospital as well as a, a sanitarium, for lack of a better phrase, right? So it was a mental health hospital facility as well as a tuberculosis hospital. So right, right. Um, there's a lot of uh, trauma 
associated with the building for sure. And even before um, that, it was the railroad hospital where I can only imagine the mm-hmm. sick and the injured that went there. Absolutely. And we know that there was, um, you know, a lot of deaths that happened on the site and, and nearby as well, because they would actually bring um, patients from the hospital sometimes over to what's now the press club. At the time, it was the Whittlesey House, and then it was owned by Mrs. M. But, you know, during those, that era, they would actually bring patients over sometimes um, for overflow or for restorative health because, you know, they would be a capacity. And so they would bring them over and set them out on the front porch to get fresh air and those types of things. So they really are deeply connected. Um, there's even stories of, and I can speak to this a bit later, but there's uh, even stories that there are, there are actual tunnels under the press club. And most of them have been collapsed, so we don't know for sure where they all go. Some stories say they go out to the old train depot. Um, but there's also a story that at least one of them runs out to the hospital, and they would transfer patients between the house and the hospital underground really? through this tunnel. So absolutely. kind of like a like the body shoot in Waverly. Very similar, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, keep it kind of hidden from public eye, perhaps. Exactly, so that it would be not so visible. And, and you know, to some degree um, – probably easier as well, I would think, you know, because you could just roll them over in a wheelchair or on a bed even. Um, We've heard that one of the rooms on the ground floor, I don't know that this is true, but we have heard that one of the rooms actually served as well as sort of a a holding room. Um, So, but there are actually stories. There's a a book about Mrs. M that was written by her daughters. And in the book, they describe um, stepping over the bodies of people who were laid out on the floors, you know, um, not, not dead people, but um, just folks who were, you know, healing. Hopefully. Yeah. So um, yeah, it was, it was, um, they were deeply connected. Cause it was a, a, a fairly small hospital. Um, if I remember right, there's only like 53 patient rooms. I believe that's right. Lydia, do you recall how many, um, I don't exactly recall how many rooms there are, but yes, it is definitely a very small hospital for sure. Um, yeah. Okay. So we have this building. It used to be a hospital, um, TB railroad, and then eventually uh sanitarium of sorts. Mm-hmm. Is there any mm-hmm. record of maltreatment of the patients or, or, torture or any of that not that i'm actually looking for that i'm just curious to know if maybe that might be contributing to some of the the haunting stories how was the treatment i wonder yeah and you know it's interesting Um, oh go ahead lydia i'm sorry oh no you go ahead you have the idea (laughs) okay um well and definitely please add to it um you know it's interesting i haven't Mm -hmm. specifically heard any documented cases of um you know mistreatment that we've heard specifically but it's pretty common knowledge that the um you know, mental health facilities for a very long time were not uh, a good place to end up. You know, um, there yeah. was a lot of uninformed ideas about treating mental illness. Um, I don't know how much of that may have happened at the hospital, but certainly we've heard those stories as well. Uh, some stories, I should say, as well. But we haven't found any, at least I haven't found any um, documentation to support that. Mm-hmm. I certainly wouldn't doubt it, though, at all. I don't sure. know if Lydia has heard something more specific. I do know that in the 80s, um, they were treating it for specifically for mental health in the 80s. So, I mean, I know that in the 80s, it wasn't too, too bad. Um, but, you know, it was still not a good place to be, um, sure. nonetheless. So, yeah, well, before that, though, I guess it was being used for just, just a regular hospital. And I'm sure that the, there's a lot of trauma associated with just being there in general and, and you know, interacting with people that are in different states of mental health. I'm sure that creates other problems uh, that necessarily wouldn't necessarily need to happen from the staff, but could happen from maybe other patients uh, traumatizing mm-hmm. others. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a quite a few, you know, cases of suicide there as well, too, that I know during the 80s. Yeah, wow. there definitely was some suicide. Yeah. And, you know, taking it back even further too to the to the time when it was a tuberculosis hospital, some of the treatments that were initiated for treating tuberculosis before they had vaccines and, you know, medications that worked. Um, for instance, at Waverly, I mean, some of those procedures that were happening there were happening at pretty much all the hospitals that were treating TB patients. And some of those involved things as invasive as actually going in and removing half of a person's rib cage um, oh, because right, there was right. this belief that, you know, it would allow them to breathe more freely. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, there was some pretty intense experimentation happening with TB patients. So wow. I think the combination of those two things leads to almost guarantee that there was at least some 
some very serious trauma for people. Yeah, I mean, we actually have seen photos, not from there, but 